Hi, everybody. I love listening to that song. It gets me so amped up. Um, I'm Avi Savar. I am the president of Suzy, and welcome to the state of the consumer. Um, today, we're talking about money and how consumers are spending going into um, this new year. Um, super excited to be sharing this content with you today. Um, I will uh, try to keep things moving so we can spend some time at the end for some Q&A. Again, my name is Avi Savar. Um, my partner in crime, Matt Britton, typically hosts uh, the State of the Consumer series, but he is off having a baby. So we're wishing him all the best and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and much joy and love to him and his wife. So uh, until, uh, until he's back, uh, you've got me sitting in at the helm of State of the Consumer. So I'm um, really um, excited to present this content to you guys today. So for those of you that don't know, Suzy is a real-time market research platform. Um, we curate and cultivate and nurture one of the highest quality audiences in market research. Um, and we've developed this series and suite of uh, advanced market research tools that connect our audience to our platform so that you can make faster, more data-driven decisions. Um, and uh, you know, we've been around for a few years and we are on our 18th episode here of the state of the consumer and we're trying to uh provide you know our customers and the uh, the, the broader uh, industry at large with insights trends um and content to support you know uh, business growth risk mitigation across a number of different verticals and so we're going to keep publishing this content as long as you keep showing up uh we really appreciate the support and the positive feedback that we've gotten around our state of the consumer series and as I mentioned, today we're talking about money. We're talking about how consumers are spending, <clears throat> where they're spending, how and why uh, they're doing some of the things that they're doing. So this study in particular was conducted um, using our proprietary panel um, and our tools through a, a, a survey of over of just around a thousand events. Um, statistically as way by ethnicity and region. Um, anything that's related it's and get rid of it. You know, in 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 you know, in a nutshell, was a roller coaster ride. Um, certainly not just for personal spending, but uh, you know, across the board, uh, personal spending. You know, saw a lot of ups and downs, uh, and and the reality is, we saw the sharpest drop, right, in consumer spending. You know, since basically the you know the, the late fifties and, and and early sixties. You can see in the kind of background of this of this graph, the uh, the, the major drop in overall spending. Uh, the flip side of that, however, is that it was followed by a pretty quick recovery. You know, you can see here, um, you know, not not everything recovered as 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 sharply. But if you look at at, at goods uh, across the board, you know, not only did it recover, but it started to uh, kind of uptick. Um, you know, services certainly, you know, a little lower in in terms of recovery. But generally speaking, you know, we're kind of back to even here. Um, which is a remarkable story in the in the wake of effectively a, a recession, a global pandemic, um, you know, social and political upheaval. Uh, the number of things that we can point to uh, over the last 12 months is just mind boggling. Uh, and the fact that the economy is where it is, um, you know, is is both nerve wracking and 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 also calming all at the same time. So therein lies the roller coaster as we continue to kind of go up and down. Um, the reality is what consumers spent on uh, dramatically changed, right? Uh, if you look you know, back here, the spending is roughly the same, but it's where those dollars have gone um, that's really causing you know, some dramatic shifts. So just quick snapshot here, you know, um, you know, some of you I'm sure have heard Petco, you know, going public again. Um, obviously, the demand for, uh, you know, pet related products uh, in the wake of COVID has kind of gone through the roof. Um, alcohol sales um, and, and, you know, home beauty and, and, uh, and personal care at home. Uh, also, a 
a big category mover, you know, um, a, a company publicly traded called Helen of Troy, really, sh you know, uh, uh, showing massive gains just as a result of, of the demand for, you know, personal care, home care, uh, um, uh, and, and, and those types of uh, goods and, and services. So, you know, really the amount of spending staying the same, just shifting into different places. The other, the other shift is, is how consumers spent, right? So we're going to talk about what they're spending on and where those dollars are going, but also kind of the modality, the how they're, they're spending is, is, is shifting up, up pretty dramatically, right? So um, clearly e-commerce and anything digital is a, a, a massive winner in, in the wake of COVID. Um, but you're also seeing some big winners in in uh, in major retail expansion, like you know, you, you see this headline here from Home Depot is they're adding more goods and more products to take advantage of of the demand, um, and then you're seeing bankruptcies across the board, you know, in in certain categories, you know, from Friendlies to J Crew and and other retailers that weren't able to to capitalize on on digital as a as a um, you know kind of a supply chain uh, factor. Um, you're also seeing pretty big shifts in entertainment consumption, right? You're looking at at brands like AMC that are, are obviously struggling pretty dramatically. Um, and in the flip side of that, you're seeing brands like Netflix, which we didn't think had much more to go up, continues to show that they can acquire you know more subscribers and more subscribers, and there's more and more demand for um, you know streaming based content. So you know. All these things uh, factored together are, are, are kind of telling a story here. The other thing that is um, important to point to is the holiday season, right? Holiday spending was up uh, versus the year before, you know, 2020 versus uh, 2019, you know, almost 10%, not quite, but pretty dramatic if you think about it, you know, as everybody's talking about, you know, recession um, and contraction, um, how and why we're seeing additional spending is 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 not just perplexing, um, but 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 you know fascinating, right? And and we'll get into some of the nuances of that um, in in a few minutes. Uh, retail sales also up, right? Obviously, certain retailers, as I mentioned, you know the ones predominantly that weren't able to catch up from a digital standpoint, um, they're struggling, they're contracting. Really, the you know mom and pop retailers. Um, having a, a harder time, but you know, clearly, big box retail um, as well as as major retail suppliers are, are seeing that like actually demand for for what they're doing is is increasing, and retail sales across the board up almost you know eight and a half percent, but eight point three percent year over year, um, and so that's resulting in an increase in personal spending, right? And and you know, there are obviously certain categories that um, you know contracted and and recovered really quickly. Uh, from you know consumer durables, food and beverage, um, housing, uh, you know, etc., to uh, other categories that contracted and are slower to recover, but on their way to recovering. We'll talk about those, and then there's going to be obviously a few that that take even longer to recover from there. So there are clear winners and losers here uh, in terms of of where dollars are shifting, where money is going, and how consumers are thinking about their uh, expenditures, um, but they're clearly in in uh, you know in in the mode of still spending, and and we'll talk about that even further. Okay, so really want to think about kind of going into 2021. Um, what will consumer spending look like, right? And we're going to compare and contrast a little bit of historical 2020 uh, numbers, and 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 uh, and then juxtapose that with you know the research that we conducted around where you know intent is going into the next year, and the things we're going to be talking about really fall into three categories certain habits, spending habits, um, certain behaviors, right? Uh, and then the impact, the impact that, you know, predominantly it has on financial services um, and certain industries. And that helps us kind of answer some of the questions, the how, the where, the what, and, and the why as it relates to consumer spending in uh, the new year. So let's start with spending habits. Uh, and before we jump in, um, you know, for those of you that uh, have spent some time with us on the state of the consumer uh, webcasts. Uh, we're going to do something called Ask America. Uh, this allows you to tap into our Suzy audience in real time. Uh, and so we'll put up some questions on the screen here and ask you to vote for what you would like us to ask our panel. Uh, and then uh, we'll we'll bring up the answers at the end of the webcast. Uh, and we'll a ask a bunch uh, of, of questions throughout each section and, and then reveal the answers at the end. So as it relates to consumer spending habits. Uh, which of the following questions would you like us to ask our audience? 
What was your biggest purchase regret of 2020? Um, what brands are you willing to spend the most on in 2021? What are you most excited to spend on in 2021? Or what is an unexpected purchase you made in 2020? So if you can take a second, uh, let us know what you uh, want us to ask our audience and uh, we will put those questions into Susie and reveal the answers uh, at the very end. So let's jump into habits. 64% of people changed their spending habits during the pandemic. That's what they told us. Um, and, and the reality is we're living in a world that's pretty splintered. And so the change in habits really breaks down, you know, almost evenly, not quite. Um, obviously, the biggest slice of the pie here is spent more, right? 42.4% uh, here said they spent more in, um, in the year. 33, about a third of, of the folks we surveyed said they spent less. And about a quarter, 23 and a half, 20, uh, sorry, 23.9%, almost 24% said they spent the same. So you can see that, um, you know, even though spending is increased in certain areas, it's contracted in certain other segments of, of the population and stayed flat in certain areas of the population. And we'll kind of dissect that a little bit. But this is another example of kind of we're living in a world that's that's very splintered. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means later in, in kind of this post pandemic, you know, case shape recovery of, you know, who's recovering and who's not and how it's being impacted. So I'm going to try to go full screen here so you guys can see this. Uh, let's do this and let's take me out of here so you can see what this kind of looks like. And this is where people are, you know, uh, spending more or less on. Obviously, cleaning supplies, you know, number one increase in, in spending, groceries, gifts, um, you know, medical and healthcare, pet care, um, gifting, eating out or taking out food. Um, obviously, uh, you know, restaurants uh, being a, a, a huge um, uh, industry that uh, the restaurant industry is hugely impacted, um, but was able to pivot pretty well to an out, uh, takeout um, mode. Clearly not a big recovery for them as of yet, but consumers still spending some dollars. And you can see a lot of them, you know, 42 percent saying that they're spending less on on eating out um, and it goes kind of down the list all the way through to you know gym memberships and toys and games but really when you see where they're spending more money on it's those kind of new essentials right groceries cleaning supplies um, gifts for others is kind of an interesting one that we'll talk about as well and really what that comes down to frankly is just reprioritization right across the board right um, we are looking at things in our world now in, a, in and through a very different lens. Um, folks used to spend a lot of money eating out. Now that though, that's shifted to in-home, right? On-premise, uh, off-premise dining. And so, you know, the uh, grooming as well, right? The, the external personal care industry is, has, has obviously been hit, um, but internally at home, you know, the demand and need for products, uh, you know, to help facilitate, you know, at home or in-home, you know, grooming and personal care through the roof. Um, generally house and home, very big category, right? Both in terms of, of home and apartment purchases, um, as well as renovations um, and other house and household goods and services. And then gifts seems to, uh, to have, have crept up quite a bit, both gifts you know, for myself and gifts for others um, becomes another uh, big category, right? And so, you know, really we're talking about a shift in prioritization, where we used to put our attention and where we used to put our money, um, you know, we're still doing the same amount, at least certain segments of the population are, uh, but we're just putting that to work in different areas. Uh, we talked, I talked a second ago about, you know, ho home purchases, right? This is a trend that's, you know, seems to be uh, continuing in that um, whether it's related to, you know, an exodus from urban centers or whether it's related to just an, you know, expediting, you know, people's typical life plans uh, over time as it relates to moving out of the, uh, moving out, buying homes. Um, we're seeing that that there are massive spikes in in um, home purchases across the board, right? And obviously, that's fueling you know banking industry, that's fueling financial services in in ways that you know probably were unforeseen, but now are are setting the stage going into next year with with uh, mortgage rates um, at at a relatively low number, 
um, folks are really thinking about where they want to, um, you know, set up shop for their for their lives and remote working becoming, you know, a, a, a bigger part of our daily routines. Um, there's a lot more flexibility and a lot more opportunity to pick and choose where I want to set up shop, uh, at, you know, in terms of, of of home and family life. So we're seeing you know record setting numbers in 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 certain um, areas as it relates to home price uh, and home purchases. 44% of consumers said they spent more on gifts for others this year, right? Um, we haven't had a chance to interact with our friends and family members in the same way. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're reliant on Zoom, we're reliant on phone calls, uh, text messages, social, but, uh, but we're not, you know, in person, right? We don't have the ability to, you know, reach out and touch somebody, hug somebody, slap somebody five, shake their hand. Um, and so, you know, being able to show our appreciation and love for others through gifting um, has has been, been a, a, a big, big trend. Um, and that was really, you know, you could see that towards the end of the year during the holiday season, right? The holiday spending through the roof, driven predominantly by e-commerce um, and, and ease of e-commerce spending uh, and, and the logistics behind e-commerce becoming you know a big part of how we think about you know delivery and 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 the products and services we buy so you know 2020 holidays you know 32 and change uh increase from the prior year in terms of of holiday spending uh which is pretty massive right i mean the the, the fact that again we're going through all these uncertain times uh, with with and through a recession, and we're seeing this level of spending, um, just shows that that you know there's still a lot of opportunity to create some pretty unique um, consumer experiences, and folks are are really still engaged um, in their day to day of of buying and shopping and um, and and gifting and doing things that they you know are yearning to do more of as it relates to kind of where they were before. 65% of consumers said they plan to spend the same, if not more, going into the new year, right? So that's a pretty big number. Well, well over, you know, a majority said that their spending levels will, will remain the same or increase, right? And so, the, you know, we're going to continue to see, you know, these types of trends going into 2021 and beyond um, as we come out of, of the pandemic in a post-vaccinated world um, and, and this kind of pent up, uh, uh, demand uh, for you know other experiences, other products and services that we we haven't been able to engage with. You know when the world opens up even further, you know the 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 the, the thought is here that that consumers will continue to push um, on on spending and, and areas. Now, what they've told us is they plan on spending generally in the similar categories that we saw in 2020. Right, we're still looking at, at groceries and cleaning supplies. You know, uh, personal and beauty care medical and, and healthcare, gifts for others, pet care, really the same general categories um, that we took look that we looked at in in uh, um, in 2020 are pushing forward into 2021. Now the question is, you know, as we get into the middle of the year and more and more of the country are, are vaccinated, more and more of the country are starting to, you know, go out and about, um, will they uh, uh, will this continue? And um, you know, the other thing that that is uh, something to point to is Almost half of the consumers we talked to um, told us that they are thinking about making a large purchase in 2021. You know, be it an automobile, a home, a vacation down the down the road in the future when when they're able to do so. You know, they're looking for ways to deploy their 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 cash. Um, and and of high income earners, almost 70 percent, right, 68 percent said they plan on making a large purchase going into uh, into this year. So, you know, clearly there are folks who are eager to spend their money uh, and get out. Um, and, you know, we're looking at car industry sales uh, expected to rise. We talked about home sales um, rising in, in certain key uh, areas. And so this trend clearly as, as interest rates stay low, um, and, and stimulus checks continue to come in, you know, that's the reality. Um, I pulled this article uh, just because I thought it was really indicative of kind of the pent up demand for, you know, folks wanting to get out and about. And, you know, literally several days after, uh, you know, uh, news broke about Carnival CEO selling some stock, uh, we're also saying and seeing that, you know, Carnival is telling us that in 2022, they've made more bookings than they had in all of 2019, right? And so folks are are, are definitely looking to get out um, and are planning to do so when the time is right, okay? Um, and I mentioned like 
there's more stimulus coming, right? And so um, that is going to juice the economy even further, right? And and whether or not you know politically you agree with it, it's coming no matter what. Um, and the reality is the, those dollars are going to make it into the economy, or they'll make it into savings accounts one way or another. Uh, and so the question becomes, where is that? Where are those dollars going to go? Uh, and we asked our our our, our panel where it went when when they first got stimulus and these are the key areas that that kind of popped right saving for the future um we'll talk about savings in a little bit uh, groceries you know supplies uh clothing paying down debt mortgage payments so that's generally where stimulus went um and we asked them the same question you know you're getting about to get a new stimulus check where are those dollars going where do you plan on 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 um, on deploying that capital um and you know here are a few verbatims that we pulled Upcoming vacation, right? Again, illustrating that pent up, you know, kind of demand for wanting to get out and about. Um, paying down bills, clearly, you know, a, a, an important part of, of the equation. Um, offsetting earning shortfall. There's a large percentage of population, and we'll talk more about this kind of dissection of, of folks um, that living, we're kind of living in different worlds. Um, there are folks who are very negatively hit, and that money is going to go to offsetting their, their lost earnings and lost wages. Um, and continued. Uh, interest and demand in home improvement projects, new furniture. People are spending more time at home, less time outside, uh, and clearly, you know, that's showing in 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 where they're putting their money, um, you know, out in the world. So, going into 2021, what can we expect to just kind of sum up the section uh, on habits? Um, you know, continued investment in these new essentials, right? The new priorities that exist in in a post pandemic world. Um, over time, those essentials may swing back. Um, maybe they'll fall somewhere in the middle as folks kind of have found new love and appreciation for, you know, cooking versus going out, um, in-home uh, uh, beauty versus going to the salon, you know, likely is some of those dollars will begin to shift back outward. But, um, uh, but, but going into 2021, you know, it's going to take quite some time for, for, you know, all of us to get vaccinated. So these new essentials are still going to become major priorities. Um, you know, stimulus frenzy and vaccine happy spending, right? That's going to start to happen as well. Um, folks are going to get bigger stimulus checks. Uh, vaccine rollout will start to take shape. Um, certain gener uh, certain populations will begin to get vaccinated sooner, um, and folks will 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 want to come out into the world and and begin to you know kind of showcase their 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 need for you know interaction and and those dollars will follow, um, and continued interest in in those big purchases, cars, homes, home renovation. You know we don't see those going away in the short term. Certainly not until you know we're all back out and about. Um, so we'll talk for a second now about um, uh, spending behaviors. I'm going to come uh, back on screen here uh, as we go into the second segment of Ask America. And, uh, you know, same as before, we're going to put up some questions for you that we are um, uh, that we'll put in front of our panel. You tell us what you want us to ask. Uh, the first question, are you OK with cash free stores in 2021? Are you willing to put big purchases on your credit card in 2021? Are you still interested in travel perks for credit cards? And or what is your biggest financial goal of 2021? Uh, so cast your vote, give it about a second here, and then we'll go into this next section on spending behaviors. Cool. So cash, cash became a little more obsolete uh, you know, over the last 12 months. Uh, and, and the reality is, you know, this was a trend that was, um, already on the rise, but certainly, you know, um, what COVID showed us is that we can kind of live in a cash free world, uh, if need be, um, only 38% of consumers use cash for purchases in, in 2020, you know, that's still a relatively high number, but at the end of the day, like it shows you the trend of where the world is going. Um, and in fact, we saw a lot of, stores, a lot of retailers decide to stop accepting cash, right? Predominantly for safety reasons. Uh, but we even saw there were a, a number of brands, even pre-pandemic, who began to um, put out a cashless uh, experience, either using, you know, credit cards, um, loyalty apps, um, you know, Apple Pay, things of that nature to, 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 to create a more frictionless experience. Um, and, and this trend continued and, and obviously the safety concerns really uh, drove some of the thinking, um, both positive and negative, right? Um, a little bit of backlash 
they, that uh, that began to to bubble up as a result of certain retailers deciding to go cashless and and you know the the big debate around whether or not that alienates folks without credit uh, and whether or not inherently you know kind of stores going cashless you know has a, a, a race undertones um, that's not for us to get into in in, in this particular uh, webinar but just pointing out that you know. There are two sides to the story here, and and some folks are thinking about cashless as 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 negative, but it is a trend that continues and and likely will continue into the future. Okay, um, on that, sixty one percent of the consumers we talked to used credit cards for a majority of their purchases in twenty twenty, right, uh, and forty two percent of them. Uh, use credit cards more than they had the prior year, right? So credit card um, usage, uh, you know, on the up, um, the the you know credit card over cash on the up, and then you know 61 uh, percent of consumers use credit cards for the majority of the purchases and 42 uh, more. So then the question is why, right? So one perks and rewards that was a key driver of why uh, consumers wanted to spend and use their credit cards more. Um, and they also felt it was the most frictionless way of, of spending, right? So 52% of the consumers we talked to said credit is simply the easiest way to pay for something, right? So ease of use, um, as well as the rise of e-commerce clearly made credit cards, you know, a dominant player in, in, in the transaction world. Um, and if you look at just kind of the balance, debit versus credit, versus cash, kind of what people are using the different modalities for, you know, credit being really used for larger purchases, impulse items, uh, gifting, debit used more for those everyday purchases, right? Consumers we talked to, 67% of them said, you know, they made the same, if not more impulse purchases during the pandemic. Um, you know, and, and we had a really interesting discussion uh, in, in putting this together around, you know, kind of what's the definition of an impulse purchase these days when, you know, you're not an in, you know, you're not really going in a store, you're not really looking at, you know, shelves as you walk to the cash register to grab those items. Um, so is it social media that's driving some of those impulses? Is it, you know, recommendation engines that are coming from e-commerce platforms that are driving some of those impulses? Um, you know, is it uh, recommendations for friends? Like what is, what are those drivers, right? And, and, and what are they? So they fall into, you know, typically these top categories when we asked about impulse purchases, food and alcohol, uh, clothing, Right, a lot of uh, leisure clothing now becoming a, a dominant, you know, need in in our you know uh, remote work uh, uh, lifestyles. Home renovation, clearly, yeah, you know, we talked about as a big category here uh, of of intent in terms of what people are thinking about and wanting to do for themselves. Uh, exercise equipment, you know, you obviously with the you know rise of of Peloton stock, uh, you know, we've seen. In, you know, clearly the demand for in-home exercise as we continue to try to stay healthy uh, and maintain, you know, kind of our our um, our fitness levels in the wake of not being able to go to a gym. Uh, and then lastly, you know, entertainment and electronics. We're not going to the movies. Uh, you know, we're not. Um, uh, we're not able to kind of engage with each other, uh, you know, at concerts and events. So you know, we're trying to make up for that in in, in home with uh, entertainment and, and electronic based purchases. Now, we've talked a lot about spending, right? Um, and, it, and it makes it seem like there's this kind of free for all of cash that's floating around. And, and in fact, that's, you know, one side of the equation. Uh, the flip side of the equation is as all the spending has increased, um, we're also seeing record savings rates, right? Uh, this is a, um, a quick look and let me go back to full screen here so you can see the, the chart. This is just you know June to September, uh, and and you look and see kind of at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the pandemic, you know into March and June of of of, of the year, um, spending uh, sorry savings rate you know really really hit an all time high and then started to kind of uh, come down a little bit. But if you look at the year overall, um, you can see obviously uh, that personal saving rates you know kind of have hit historical highs. Um, you know, folks are, 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 are buckling down. And, and the reality is, you know, how is that possible? We talked about all this spending. So if people are, are, are spending more, you know, or how are they saving more as well? And the reality is it, they're not really the same people. Um, if you remember, we talked about this idea that, you know, kind of a, a good chunk of, of the population are spending more, uh, a good chunk are spending less and some are spending about the same. And so you're starting to see kind of these different groups of folks 
um, display different types of behaviors. So on one side, you've got a lot more spending. On the other side, you've got a lot more savings. Um, and you know that just goes to show the 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 you know the the haves and the have-nots um, as it relates to kind of our country continue to divide. There's been a lot of talk this year about you know inequality, um, uh, economic inequality, and and for better or for worse, you know COVID has. Um, made that probably worse, not better. Uh, you know, here you got you know a headline from NBC: Wall Street has minted 56 new billionaires since the pandemic began. Um, but at the same time, you've got a, a large population of of the country unable to pay their bills, right? Um, and uh, and and it's a you know that's a struggle that will continue you know into the coming years as we begin to um, you know kind of come out of this recession. Uh, but it just shows you the the duality of of the circumstances that we're living in, both as it relates to spending and saving, uh, and how people are 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 dealing with you know kind of the macroeconomic uh, conditions. Um, uh, Matt, my partner talked about this in, in the last webinar he did, but you know I thought it's kind of important as we talk about these kind of you know dualities uh, that we are living in a recovery that is you know reflective of that, right? It, you know, we, the, this idea of a K-shaped recovery where you know things are splintering up and down as it relates to certain industries that are recovering, uh, maybe even accelerating out of and you know into and out of the, the pandemic. And then clearly industries that are in need of assistance um, and those industries, not just as it relates to where consumers are spending, but but the people that work in those industries um, are obviously one suffering, uh, you know, um, uh, pretty dramatically. So, you know, you've got a good chunk of the population that are trying to make their way out of this thing. And then you've got a whole other chunk of the population, you know, who are effectively thriving as a result of it. And that creates its own mess of, of, of both opportunities and and uh, and disasters. Um, you know, 54%, almost half, a little more than half of our consumers we talked to said they invested the same, if not more, in 2020. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, kind of the, um, the, the, the desire for investing, you know, kind of increasing, certainly. Uh, and, and almost half of them say they plan on in, um, saving even more going into the new year, going into this year. And, and where are they putting those, those dollars? Right now, a lot of it is they're sitting in savings accounts. Right, so there's a little bit of cash hoarding, you know, happening. Um, stocks and bonds, uh, and then larger pur purchases like, like you know, homes, etc., um, are also where some of those investment dollars are are, are going. Um, but predominantly, you're seeing that that it's you know savings accounts that are that are beginning to um, grow as a result of some of these you know um, spending behaviors and habits. So, what can we expect, you know, going into uh, the new year, going into this year? Increased uh, usage of credit card, you know, as cash begins to continue to to, to become obsolete, um, you know, the increased uh, uh, both of uh, both investments, savings, and spending, right? So across the board, we're, there are going to be you know massive opportunities to interact with consumers on both sides of the coin, both in terms of 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 how and where they're spending their dollars, uh, but as well you know, how and where they're investing and saving their dollars, right? And so both of those pathways are, are, are way open for, um, uh, for, for growth and opportunity going into the, uh, into the year. Um, and then, you know, the need for more financial planning services, right? As people are starting to think about their worlds in different ways, um, you know, there's a demand and a desire for help. Uh, and the institutions that can come out of the gate, and we'll talk about the impact on financial services in a moment, um, you know, those are the ones that are gonna begin to create new uh, relationships with consumers um, that are gonna pay dividends going into, you know, the next several years. Okay, so the next section here, and I'm gonna come back uh, to full screen. Uh, as we open up uh, the next section, which is the impact on financial services. So we talked about the habits, we talked about the behaviors. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about the impact on, on, on the industry. Uh, and before we do that, uh, we will do our third and final uh, Ask America question. Uh, so let us know, which of the following questions do you want us to ask our uh, panel? What financial services company most meets your needs? What financial services company has provided the best perks during COVID? What was your favorite reward or perk you discovered this year? What is your biggest reason for dropping a credit card? Um, let us know what you want us to ask uh, by completing this little survey in front of you and, uh, and we'll reveal the answers in, in just a little bit. Okay, 
over half the consumers that we spoke to engage directly with a financial services company, you know, in some capacity uh, over the last year and, in, uh, you know, and through 2020. And here's here's what they were doing and where they were engaging. Um, 26 percent of them opened a new credit card. Um, 25 percent of them invested more in the stock market. Uh, 23 percent opened a savings account. 20 percent invested in the stock market for the first time. Uh, and just under 20%, 19% opened a checking account, right? So there's definitely activity happening here. And when we talked to, and asked them about where they plan on continuing their engagement with financial services, um, roughly continued, right? So about 30% continue, uh, said they're going to continue to invest more in the stock market. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic number. 22% said they'd sign up for a new credit card. 21% uh, a new savings account. 19% said they'd invest in the stock market for the first time, and 17% said they'd open a checking account. So I'm just gonna go back and forth between these two slides for a second. And you can see generally, like these are pretty high numbers. These are where the opportunities are for um, you know financial services companies to engage with consumers based on the demand and the need that they see um, and where and how they're gonna engage with you. Um, here's what consumers told us as it relates to kind of their, their engagement and, and their interactions with financial services and why. Um, looking to reduce cost right uh and spend because they're generally not working as much uh they want their money to earn more money right so uh so they can do all the things they want to do such as traveling and visiting all the states uh i love that one everybody's dying to get out and about and i think some of the uh the dollars their savings are, are going to be you know kind of put to good use when they can do that and they're sitting on the sidelines you know waiting for that moment um uh, a few other quotes, achieve dividends to continue investing in securities to keep my money in production, right? People are, are getting more educated about, you know, the, how money works and the value of letting your money work for you. So again, um, especially as younger generations are, are, are getting more and more involved in, in the markets, um, you're seeing that kind of become a mainstay, right? As millennials continue to invest, brands like Robinhood have been, you know, kind of gone through the roof as a result of, you know, new demands for new generations coming in and taking action and taking more responsibility over their financial futures. 75% of the consumers we spoke to um, tried to capitalize on a credit card perk. Credit card perks, you know, as we talked about earlier, one of the key drivers of why folks were using credit cards, um, especially in, in, in times of crisis like this. Um, and 50% of them actually used the cashback perk of some kind. Right. So of the folks we talked to, more than about half of them actually, um, you know, uh, uh, leveraged a cashback perk, which, which is a pretty high number. 31% um, of them use some discount offered, um, you know, by a perk or reward through a credit card. Again, so these are, 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 are pretty dominant areas of opportunity where, where credit card companies, financial services companies are seeing areas to, to be able to engage, especially when kind of the typical rewards-based models, which have been predominantly travel um, and hospitality, seem to have taken a back burner you're looking at, at these organizations now trying to revamp their loyalty rewards programs to take advantage of other areas um because 47 percent of consumers say that their perks could still be better so even though it's a key driver of their behavior they're craving and they're yearning and they're wanting more right um it's a key driver of why you know they they appreciate the relationship they have with their credit card companies their financial service institutions is because of these rewards and perks and they're yearning and craving for more of them and that's and therein lies the opportunity right um a lot of brands have already reacted we'll talk about a few of them in a second um but this idea of being able to kind of create an emotional connection gives an entirely new um you know uh, a definition to the word loyalty, right? These are all loyalty programs, right? These these membership rewards programs, these points programs, uh, et cetera, they're all built in and around loyalty. Um, and now that loyalty is also kind of making its way to utilization, meaning I'm gonna use the card more, I'm gonna engage more with my financial services uh, um, a partner because of the rewards that I'm getting and that drives and creates, you know, additional loyalty and utilization. So really that seems to be the biggest opportunity that we've uncovered. Um, and perks and rewards definitely matter more than ever. You're seeing a ton of, of shifts uh, uh, that are, that are coming in, uh, both, you know, new organizations that are launching rewards programs, as well as existing ones that are shifting their, their, their current rewards programs to take 
you know, kind of better advantage of the opportunities at, at large, especially given the fact that, you know, travel and hospitality, which have been the key drivers of rewards points to date, are not as valuable as they used to be. Um, really great positive feedback from a lot of these, you know, a lot of consumers out there as it relates to, you know, brands like Amex that have evolved their loyalty rewards programs to take advantage of other areas, right? Additional points being rewarded for things like gas purchases, groceries, um, things of that nature, right? Whereas Amex really predominantly their membership rewards program has been driven on, on travel. You're seeing an expansion of, 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 um, of that program at, at scale. And it's really been, you know, a very positive experience for consumers uh, and a very positive for the brand. Um, Chase Sapphire as well adds groceries to, to you know, major categories for their rewards, um, as well as partnerships with brands like Peloton, right? We talked about exercise equipment, you know, and, uh, um, and being a, a, a big impulse purchase for the year. Clearly, you know, Chase Sapphire, you know, saw that trend, created the partnership with, with Peloton, and here you go. Um, again, creating some positive experiences for consumers at, at large. Uh, Delta as well, revamping their rewards uh, uh, programs, um, you know, and taking advantage of, of consumers easing back into travel. Um, and all of that really, you know, we asked them kind of generally how they're feeling about, you know, the expansion of rewards, the expansion of, of these loyalty based systems um, as it relates to their relationship with financial services and the top three emotions that they told us that they're experiencing were excited thankful and relieved, right? These are all very positive um, uh, emotions uh, that, you know, if you are a brand and you're able to elicit these responses from consumers, then you are doing something right. Uh, and if you can continue to, you know, extract these emotions of gratitude and excitement and relief, then you are addressing major pain points you know, in, in the population, you are tapping into uh, behaviors that, that are resonating uh, with consumers um, and you're creating value, which at the end of the day is what builds brands. Um, that being said, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, almost 50% of, of folks earlier and, uh, you know, who, who think there's more to be done here. Um, same over, you know, roughly a third say they want more flexibility with their perks, right? So this is a key, key driver of, of um, behavior and desire in, in the industry uh, that, that I think, you know, we'll talk about in a second as, as probably the biggest key takeaway. Um, 30% of the consumers we talk to want better customer service as they navigate through their financial services uh, experiences. Um, and, and we asked them kind of what and why, and here are a few verbatims that we pulled. They're looking for new strategies to improve, right? Uh, they don't wanna wait long times on the phone to talk to representatives, right? They're, and, and so they're, they, they're looking for direct access. Uh, they're looking for new ways of thinking um, they want, you know, to be more flexible. They want the ability to do most things online themselves and they want the flexibility to take, you know, kind of control over their own existence and, and experience. Um, and they're looking, you know, for new benefits that can help them through these difficult times. Right. And so all of these areas of opportunity um, kind of exist as it relates to, you know, where and, and what consumers want out of their relationship with with their financial partners. Um, that's also driving behavior. You know, a lot of these these organizations, um, you know, are making some bets. Uh, you know, here's a headline uh, that that you know from about a month ago, le less than a month ago, J.P. Morgan acquired you know a, a major uh, credit card rewards business, betting that travel is going to rebound next year, and seeing the advantage of of loyalty and rewards as part of the the um, the, the kind of the new zeitgeist. Obviously, uh, J.P. Morgan is kind of part of the, the the Chase Sapphire experience as well, which we talked about. Um, Walmart you know, looking to create, you know, more financial services opportunities for their consumers, uh, partnering, you know, with the investment firm behind Robinhood to create their own fintech startup. You know, I'll read just the, the third bullet here. For years, millions of customers have put their trust in Walmart to not only save them money when they shop, but help them manage their financial needs, right? That's the CEO of Walmart talking. And they've made it clear they want more from us in the financial services arena. So look at that. You're seeing now, you know, one of the largest retailers in the world getting into the game because they're controlling the front door of their, you know, consumer's experience and they have the ability and trust of, of their consumers to be able to kind of take them down this road. Uh, and so, you know, not only are, are you know, uh, financial services uh, firms taking advantage, but, you know, these trends are broadening out even further as it relates to, you know, kind of what's going on in the world. So 
to kind of wrap up uh, here, opportunities for financial services uh, in 2021, more flexibility with points and perks. We talked about that a lot. There's a lot of opportunity with loyalty to take advantage of you know, new desire, new behavior, new habits. Um, that drives a close relationship between the consumers and the cards they're using and the service firms that they're they're experiencing uh, with on a day to day um, and driving innovative ways to adapt to kind of people's changing needs. Right. So there are opportunities. The Walmarts uh, uh, and the chases of the world are, are showing that, you know, there are acquisitions to be made, new business units to be launched, new programs to be um, spun out. Um, and all of that is making its way into you know the new year. So with that, um, we will kick it over to uh, getting our results from Ask America. I'll ask my, uh, uh, my partner in crime here, uh, Abel, to join uh, and, and help with the sharing of the results. Abel, how you doing, brother? You're on mute. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yes. Loud and clear. <laughs> Cool. All right. So the first question that you guys wanted us to ask is, uh, what are you most excited to spend on in 2021? So um, no surprise here. And it's pretty aligned to, to my own personal spending here. But a lot of people are looking to travel, um, travel, vacations. Um, they're looking to spend more money on their family and they're looking to invest more in their houses, homes, um, and, and really helping to, to continue to build a better experience for them. So I kind of just dived into um, some of the open-ended. And just for people who don't know here, this is basically the Suzy platform. So, um, you know, me, I was able to go in, launch the questions at the beginning of this call, and we were able to get those responses. So here, uh, some of my favorite responses are they're looking to travel, go to another country. Uh, a lot of people are really interested in investing in the future and for their kids. Uh, they're interested in purchasing new electronic products, um, getting some of the latest computers, video games, smartphones. So uh, I think people are really optimistic right now for uh, 2021. And I'm hoping that they will get an opportunity to travel. Yeah, I sure am. <laughs> As <am I. laughs> uh, what is your biggest financial goal of 2021? Uh, so again, here, really, you just see people want to continue um, saving money here. Uh, they want to make sure that they're saving enough for retirement, for emergencies. Um, and, and they also want to make sure they're paying down those debts and kind of just securing themselves up for the future. So um, again, here, I, I picked some of my favorite open-ended questions here, but um, people want to be able to save so that they can finally be able to buy a house. Uh, they want to make sure that they are saving as much so that they don't have to pull from their savings accounts. Um, people want to save up to $10,000 here. Um, so I think it's really interesting insight for financial services companies, but how can they really help create different content and programming that help to educate people on how you save best, how you really do a lot of that financial planning uh, and how you can make sure that you're setting yourself up for some of that long-term success, um, you know, whether it's college saving or purchasing a home or something like that. Right. Uh, and then our final question here, what was your favorite credit card reward perk uh, that you discovered this year? So um, a lot of people have really enjoyed getting credit back on, on their account. Um, you know, cash back is really important. Some of those travel uh, benefits, Amazon points. Um, and here, I think it was really more interesting to dive into um, some of the uh, perks here. So um, here, someone said that they really like that they can now redeem, um, you know, perks uh, directly at some of their favorite stores. Uh, here, they like the fact that they have more cash back. Um, people here, again, I think we touched on earlier, but people are still struggling a lot. So the ability to get credit directly on a bill um, so that they can pay for things like health insurance and some of those necessities that might have arisen during um, COVID is really important. Um, people are really liking the fact that they can spend some of their money um, at places like Costco where they can stock up on some of those essentials. Um, one of my favorites, which I definitely used, was the discount on the Peloton membership app that Chase Sapphire offered there, which was pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, people like that they're getting cash back at the places that they're spending a lot of their money. So um, some really interesting things. And I think even from an anecdotally, I've seen a lot of credit card companies have shifted. Um, you know, I primarily use travel credit cards, but they've shifted a lot of it so that um, it's more applicable to kind of day to day under COVID. So some really interesting, um, you know, insights there. Was that, was, was that, is that Peloton over your shoulder? Was that an impulse purchase, Abel? Or, or uh... a 1000% impulse purchase. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, but people are looking for ways to transform their existing spaces into, yeah. uh, you know, ways that they can exercise. And especially as it's getting colder, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting to see, um, you know, how, how people have kind of started to buy those impulse purchases. But yeah. how, how have you, how have you thought about, 
you kind of your financial world have you have you found yourself this year to have spent more saved more spent and saved more um you know where where have you netted out in 2020 as a as a young millennial up and comer so yeah I, i'll give you my perspective as a millennial i think you know i i traditionally spent a lot more money on travel and experiences um you know i was really into that experience economy that you hear a lot of people talk about for millennials so I think what was nice about twenty uh, about twenty twenty is that we had you know for months and months we weren't leaving the apartment, so you were saving a lot more. So um, I think for the first time in my life, I you know much like the rest of America, we started making sizable investments uh, in things that we have in, and, and started really doing a lot more of that long term financial planning that um, you know previously may have been spent on a trip to Europe or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So do you? I mean, does that does it res does that resonate with you? This notion that you can actually spend more and save more at the same time. Like, and I when I first saw the data in the report, you know, it took me a minute to kind of wrap my head around it. Maybe that's because you know, a little older school here. But you know, usually, um, you know, when you're spend you know when you're spending you know out, out the nose, uh, your bank account goes to zero. But in this particular case, as you said, like you're not spending on other things. So does it feel to you like you're spending more or are you actually spending about the same because you're not spending on, you know, going out to dinner, going to concerts, going to shows, et cetera. Yeah. So it almost feels like you're spending more, but you're really spending the same. You're just spending it on new stuff, other things that you weren't using it on. Um, and at the same time, it allows you a little bit of opportunity to save. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's probably spending around the similar or less amount, but I think it's really just that shift in different categories, right? So traditionally, I would have spent more in probably restaurants, dining, um, more experience culture, things like that. Um, but now, like I, my grocery bill is double what it's ever been, you know, pre-pandemic. So it's just really a shift in kind of how we're spending money. Um, and I think because of that, you know, and I, I know this from a lot of my friends, we're we're a lot more willing to spend on like more expensive food products um, because we know we're going to cook them, and it's uh, and you're not spending a lot more in restaurants. So. Um, yeah. It's definitely a shift in in both kind of like how we're spending, and I think that the research definitely shows that people are changing how they're they're spending um, here. And here we here's an interesting comment. Couldn't agree more. As a millennial, I'm going out less and less. This is from Rebecca, so I'm spending less on that. However, I've spent more on wellness products and things for my home. Uh, definitely overall spending less, but my spending has changed in where money is going. So um, I think that, that that really resonates there with people. Yeah. yeah. Any other any other questions coming in? Yeah, so we have a, a few questions here from the audience, but um, one thing that people are interested in learning about is what do you think the future of subscription services will look like, uh, especially for packaged goods and how that will impact kind of spending in general? It's a great, I mean, it's a great question. You know, subscription services have been on the rise, um, you know, for a long time. I think there's a lot of ease uh, and and less friction, you know, that that consumers experience. Um, the question becomes: in your subscription, you know, what is the real value that you're providing, right? And and does that value extend beyond just, you know, the individual product or service, right? Am I subscribing to just getting aspirin once a month because I use it? You know, I could probably just add it to my card and buy that, you know, as I go ad hoc. Um, or am I subscribing to something broader that's more of a health and wellness platform that allows me to do a bunch of other things? So the question becomes like, you know, very similar to I think, you know, what we talked about in the in the deck about, you know, points, loyalty and rewards. You know, people are craving and yearning kind of more engagement and more experiences. And I think subscription based services are demonstrating that, you know, they can combine a little bit of that like value creation, ease of use, a little less friction. Some consumers may even be willing to spend a little bit more. Because of that, if the value is there, maybe there's a community connected to it on the back end. You know, maybe there's access to other things that they didn't have before, uh, in addition to the physical item that they're purchasing or subscribing to. So I definitely see subscription as a business model that will continue to evolve and grow. You know, every uh, every brand is thinking about you know how to do it. Uh, you know, that started way before pandemic, right? That was you know Dollar Shave Club style thinking. That that you know made its way into some of the biggest you know um, consumer packaged goods companies in the world, and that starts from music services to you know razor blades and and everything in between. Yeah, I, I think for me, what's interesting is that pre-pandemic, I I would always go purchase my packaged goods in person, um, but I've almost exclusively shifted all my spending for those to Amazon. So everything from paper yeah. towels to toilet paper to cleaning supplies. And what I think is interesting about that is that Amazon actually has a built in subscription service that you can do. Um, so like you can subscribe to getting toilet paper once a month in a package. So I think it's going to be right. 
interesting to see, especially with, um, you know, some of my lazier millennial counterparts, um, how they're going to just, you know, shift to that kind of spending there. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, next question here for you is, um, uh, you know, one of the things with all of this, uh, you know, subscription services uh, and a lot more of this, you know, shipping uh, products is that that's increasing kind of carbon footprint and just like the amount of packaging that's going into um, getting all these products around. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what 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 do you think companies can do to maybe help prevent some of these uh, more long term environmental issues? It's a big it's a it's a big problem. This is just anecdotal. Right. Uh, you know, I, I've seen it in our own household, the number of cardboard boxes that show up every day. Right. Everything, you know, from Amazon boxes to Zappos boxes to food delivery. Um, you know, you're seeing more and more like dry ice packages, more and more uh, different types of shipping containers. So, you know, I, I, it is going to be a challenge. I think, you know, um, you know, folks like Amazon are doing some smart things like, um, there are, you know, Amazon day delivery, you know, so you can get everything on the same day, maybe all in one box. Uh, and so they're trying to minimize it over time, but, um, you know, nobody's really solved that yet. Um, I think, you know, until we get to a place where, you know, boxes are going to self-destruct and biodegrade by themselves, uh, that, that, that issue is going to continue to, to exist. Um, my hope is, you know, the entrepreneur in me says that that's an opportunity, uh, and, and that the kind of the capital markets will take care of that problem over time. Uh, but it's, you know, it's definitely, uh, at least for me, I've experienced it and seen it kind of firsthand and, and, uh, I don't see it getting any better. Yeah, <laughs> I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, I, I wish I had an answer, right? Like the answer <laughs> to solve it. I don't have the answer to solve it. Uh, but it's a, it's a really, uh, I think it's an important point. And, you know, I even see it like, you know, younger, you know, my daughter who's 12, you know, um, you know, uh, has a greater sense of understanding of, of the of, of the kind of the world at large um, than I ever thought because she's the one who pointed it out to me. She's like, you know, Dad, like, you know, in a world where we're supposed to be recycling, like, aren't we like actually doing a bad thing with all of these boxes showing up now that we, you know, and and you know, it, it's top of mind. It's top of mind for the younger generation, um, you know, as well as it is for our viewers. Clearly, right. Um, uh, a next question here is if you could kind of peer uh, into your your crystal ball here, like what are your projections about traditional spending milestones like back to school uh, and maybe this upcoming holiday season uh, if hypothetically we are, you know, going back into a non-COVID world? Yeah, it's a great question. So I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have Susie. Uh, and Susie, I think, is the closest thing to a crystal ball that 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 exists in in business. And you know, I, like without without asking Susie right now, I would tell you, you know, my my thought is we're going to continue to see the same trends, right? We're going to continue to see um, you know bigger holiday spending going into the back half of the year. Um, I think, and I hope, as we enter a kind of post vaccinated world, which you know who knows the timeline, but let's hope by the fall, uh, by back to school, we're kind of, you know, in a better place. I think you're going to start to see some dollars shifting back to experiences and travel and, and hospitality. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, talk of, you know, a roaring twenties, you know, like comeback. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. I still, part of me believes that, you know, I don't think we've seen the full impact of this recession yet. Um, you know, the stimulus checks, you know, are going to go a long way in helping ease that recovery. Um, does that, you know, does that drive inflation? Who the hell knows? Uh, so I, I don't know if we've seen yet the full impact of, of you know, what's happened. All right. But, uh, you know, it, it seems to be pointing to, you know, the direction that you're going to have a good chunk of the population in this K-shaped recovery that they're making more money, their jobs are, are secure, they actually have more freedom in their jobs than before based on remote working opportunities that didn't exist before, right? Now, granted, that's a subset of the population, right? It's not the entire population. And there's going to be, you know, the other side of it where, you know, folks are going to have to get back to work in hospitality, get back to work in travel, and that's gonna be slow going. Um, and I think you're still gonna see this disparity continue. I think that's gonna be one of the biggest issues for us to solve you know, as a, as a country, uh, if not as a world, this kind of divide of the haves and the have nots, this idea that you know, you're either gonna be you know, on the side of the equation where you're telling the computer what to do, or you're going to be on the other side of the equation where you're being told what to do by a computer, right? And depending on what side of that 
equation you're in will determine, you know, your level of recovery, your level of spending, your level of ability to save. Um, and I think that's just the new world order that we're moving towards for better or for worse. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and just because you brought it up yourself, Avi, but uh, you said that, you, you know, you have Susie in your back pocket. So for the people who don't really know Susie here, what are people using Susie for? What exactly can you do on it? Like, give us a give us a little one minute speech on it. I love it. Thank you for asking. Uh, so, you know, things that that our customers are, are using Susie for really it's 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 validating assumptions testing um you know concepts um package claims pa uh, packaging uh concepts logo designs creative testing innovation r d Re really what what suzy allows you to do as a brand is is effectively two things right it's either mitigate risk or help drive growth um, those two factors require research and require understanding and human understanding and Suzy is all about enabling human understanding at scale in real time, right? We're living in a world where, you know, things are changing by the minute, behaviors are changing by the day, um, and, it, and, and the need for accessing the voice of the consumer has never been greater. Um, we've been very fortunate to be on that, you know, the positive side of COVID where our business has accelerated as a result because changes are afoot. Right. We're surrounded by change everywhere um, and brands need a crystal ball to help guide them in some of the decisions that they're making so that they can mitigate their risk and help drive growth. And Suzy does that by combining a panel of, you know, a million and a half consumers um, with software that allows you to ask questions, run surveys, show stimulus, show creative, um, you know, run trackers, uh, you name it. And so if you're in the business, of dealing with consumers, um, you know, Suzy is probably a, 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 a platform you should look at. Definitely. And um, just one final note there for anyone that's interested, uh, I just put a link uh, right in the chat. So you can go right there and just book a demo and we'll connect you with one of our, um, you know, insights experts who can kind of chat with you about different ways that um, Suzy can kind of fit into your life as well. Um, and Avi, I think that's really all the questions that we have for you. Awesome. I, I appreciate the time. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to just put my deck back up here and, and say thank you to everybody. You know, I think, uh, you know, on behalf of myself and, and all the folks at Suzy, we're, we're super excited to be able to continue showing you the state of the consumer reports. I'm Avi Savar. I'm the president of Suzy. On behalf of, you know, the whole team at Suzy, my partner, Matt, who typically runs these sessions, uh, and again, we wish him and his wife all the best in uh, in their in their new addition to their family. Um, and until we meet again, thank you for your time.